morning. Good to see the auditorium beginning to fill up. Uh, this is definitely a great encouragement. Uh, since March, towards the end of March, when um, we stopped having our, our meetings, it's been quite a, uh, a sight to preach in this auditorium and uh, to only have our technical team and musicians are present. So it's a great joy for me to, to begin to see this. And uh, uh, yes, we, we cannot fill up the entire auditorium because of uh, um, the authorities, but it's still uh, a great joy that we are at least managing to fill up uh, the quarter that we are allowed to fill up. Please turn with me to Second uh, Peter and chapter one. Second Peter and chapter one, and uh, we will read uh, from verse five to verse eleven. Though we are really concentrating on the tenth verse, Second um, Peter, chapter one, we will read from verse five for the purpose of context. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Those of you who have been following uh, the preachings in the last couple of months will realize that this chapter of Second Peter is being preached under the theme, Christian, grow up. And there's no doubt that if you meditate upon this passage, you will see that that would have been the burden that the Apostle Peter had as he was opening up this particular book and more precisely this particular chapter. The point that he is making is, first of all, that all of us have the same provisions by God to enable us to be spiritual giants and indeed to have a glorious arrival or entrance into heaven. The same potential. So it, it, there's no need for anybody to be continuing in their Christian lives still sucking their thumbs, so to speak, as though they are newborn babies. We all have been given like precious faith. But the second thing that we notice from Peter here is that what tends to make the difference is this diligence in adding to our faith various spiritual qualities, which Peter has listed from verse 5 there down to verse 7 for us. Be because some believers tend to have the attitude that um, it, it, it's simply sort of going to meetings and, 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 and being rather laid back and and somehow you still see yourself growing. 
And that's absolutely wrong. The Bible is fairly clear that if you are diligent in your own spiritual growth, you make progress. If you are going about your Christianity half asleep, you do not make progress. And hence the appeal here that we as individuals need to grow up. Last time, we asked the question, what is it that makes individuals who have professed faith to, to be content with a, a mediocre spiritual life? What is it? And we answered the saying that it is because they have forgotten God's grace in pardoning them of their sins. We saw this in verse 9 last time. Uh, the Apostle Peter says, For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. In other words, we, we get so carried away with only the things that are near, the things that are physical. Things to do with where I will get my bread and, and how I will pay for my rentals and, and, and how I will manage my children going through school and, and, and these physical things that are near that in the process we lose sight of the eternal things, the things which in fact matter even more. And because we are so carried away with these momentary things that are here now and tomorrow will be gone, the result is that we do not put the emphasis on spiritual things and our own spiritual growth. That's what we saw last week, or rather last time. Today, we're going on to see the benefits of this diligence of um, adding virtue and, and knowledge and, and self-control and steadfastness and godliness and so on. What, what is the benefit? Now, in a sense, we've already seen something of this in verse 8, when the Apostle Peter said, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we saw that one of the benefits of this is that your life becomes fruitful. You, you, you count in God's kingdom. You are effective even in the context of the church. You are bearing fruit. It is evident to all. Souls are getting saved. Souls are growing up in the things of God. People are praising God because of the impact of your life in their own lives. But then in verse 10... Uh, the Apostle Peter speaks about two benefits there. And in a sense, they are tied together. One is that you gain assurance. You gain assurance. You get to, to sense more and more that truly I am a child of God. And then in the second is that you gain stability. You gain safety. You gain in terms of not falling. Let's read verse 10, and then we will look at it in a little more detail. Verse 10 there says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these things, you will never fall. If you practice these things, you will never fall. So what is Peter teaching us there? First of all, as we've already said, 
that when you are adding these qualities, these spiritual qualities to your life, and you are diligent about it, you are at the same time growing in your assurance. He begins there with the little word, therefore, uh, suggesting that this is because of what he has already been speaking about. Therefore, brothers, he says, be all the more eager. What is it that he has been saying that simply makes this a conclusion? Well, we saw this in verse 8, that as you are adding these qualities to your spiritual life, what is happening is that you are becoming effective, more and more effective, more and more fruitful. And as you are becoming more and more effective and more and more fruitful, what is actually happening is that you are gaining a sense of assurance. Peter is obviously, at this point, very absorbed with what he's writing. He, he refers to, to the people that he's writing to in this text as brothers. Therefore, brothers. Now trust me, both in First Peter and also in Second Peter, he never uses this phrase. This is the only time that Peter uses this phrase. It is a phrase that is, he's fond of using, which is more a, a phrase of endearment. It, it, it is one that is translated in the English, beloved. That's the one that Peter loves to use. When you check in, in First Peter, he uses it at least twice. In Second Peter, he uses it at least three times, especially in the third chapter. Look at this, chapter 3 and verse 1. Uh, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved, he says. We see it also in verse 8 of chapter 3. But do not Overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. We see the same in verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for this. And finally in verse 17. You therefore, beloved, knowing this before. That's Peter's favorite phrase. It's, it's what he says without thinking. But now he is saying, therefore, brothers. Therefore, brothers. Why hold back this sense of affection? Well, it's obvious that uh, at this point, Peter simply wants to, to make an appeal to all those who are claiming the name of Christ. He wants to make an appeal to them that there is this one way in which they can know whether they are saved or not. There is this one way in which they can ensure they do not make shipwreck of their faith. And it is by this diligent adding to their faith, the qualities that he spoke about earlier on. And you can't miss the emphasis again from the way he says, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent. It, it, it's, it's as though someone is saying, run with all your might, and then he goes further and says, Put in everything. Well, running with all your might is putting in everything. But it's clear that, that Peter realizes that he, he, he does need to make this emphasis. He's been talking about it already. I mean, look back at verse 5. What did he say there? He said in verse 5, for this reason, make Every effort, he has already said. Make every effort. And yet, he's still not content. 
to leave it there. He still wants to repeat. And the point he's making is quite simple. It is this. Make this your highest priority, O child of God. Make this your highest priority. What is that? It is by confirming your calling and election. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent or eager to confirm your calling and election. Now, let me quickly put it this way, that when Peter says, be all the more diligent to, to make your calling and election sure, he, he's not suggesting that, yes, you've, you've been adding these qualities now do something else. Rather, it is by adding these qualities that you are making or confirming your calling and election. Um, I remember when I was growing up, when we had holidays every so often, we used to have uh, relatives coming to stay with us. And uh, I've never forgotten uh, one of my cousins who um, never used to put on weight. Uh, part of the reason is that he had a very bad appetite or poor appetite. He just used to eat a little bit. Uh, so as much as they might try to convince him that, you see, it is in eating that you put on weight. For some reason, he never really believed them. Uh, so, uh, when he would be eating, he would be deliberately wanting to gain weight. So, I've never forgotten, this is now uh, a good uh, 50 years ago, but each time he puts food into his mouth, he'd go like, he eats again. He eats. And he kept at it. And then, of course, he wouldn't eat as much as the rest of us. Failing to realize that you don't grow fat by trying to do it directly. No. You grow fat by eating and eating a lot. That's how you gain weight. In the same way here, you don't confirm your, your calling and election by, by confirming your calling and election. <laughs> you don't. You do it by the addition of these qualities to your life. And as you are doing that, indirectly, there is a sense of assurance that fills your soul that I am truly a child of God. An obvious example is just the very first virtue that is spoken about there, and it is the word virtue itself, which, which stands for excellence. Uh, it, it's, it's you wanting to have the, the highest levels of, of spirituality, of godliness, of love, excellence in your spiritual life. You, you never satisfied with mediocre uh, life and living spiritually. You're never satisfied with mediocrity. Now, what is it that, that is the dynamo in your soul that causes you to do that? What is it? You conclude, I think it's because the Lord has saved me. Because before he saved me, I just used to go to church, I, I, I wasn't interested in whether I was the best that I could possibly be for God. Um, I, I recall myself when before I got converted, they would give us, the parents would give us money to go and give a church, and we would in the process get smaller change out of our pockets, and that's what we would throw into the offering bag. At least they've seen us putting something there. They don't know that we've changed. It's now smaller change. Uh, and, and so on. That's you before you are converted. You get converted, you want to give as much as you possibly could without hurting your, your uh, economic and financial 
uh, domestic life and so on. What is it that has changed that? You realize the Lord has saved so I've just used one example here. But you could make your way through all these. You, you can come, for instance, to the subject of knowledge. Previously, you were not really interested in, in, in thinking through spiritual things. You're not interested in, in, in wanting to buy books or to borrow books or to, to, to try and read and study and, and really understand the truths of God's kingdom and so no, 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 no. You were half asleep in church. The sermon was too long. You're already looking at your watch. You wanted to go home and so on. Uh, other people seem to have been getting a bit of knowledge and you think they're just intelligent or maybe they want to become pastors and so on. That was your attitude. But that's changed. You are now an individual. You want to know. You buy books. You borrow books. You deliberately cave out time for Bible study and church services. And you write down the things that you really want to capture and know and learn and so on. What's made the difference? You conclude, the Lord has saved me. He's given me a hunger to know him more. And what's happening there? is that there's a greater sense that the Lord has saved me. So that's how you are all the more eager to confirm your calling and election. But before we move on, it's interesting how the Apostle Paul uses this double phrase, calling and election. Calling refers to the work that Jesus does by his spirit at the point when we are converted. He gives us what we have been studying in our Bible studies recently in the midweek, the effectual call. That's what he gives us, the effectual call. That is the life-giving call that takes us from death to life, out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light. So that's the first. But behind that call, behind that call is the electing grace of God the Father. The electing grace of God the Father. And these two go together. Look very quickly with me at 1 Corinthians and chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul is really talking about God's call, that conversion that, that, that takes place when, when individuals become God's children. He has mentioned it in passing in um, verse, verse 14, um, verse 24, when he says there, and to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. To those who are called, at the point they hear the gospel, and their eyes are opened to the good news that saves sinners through the person and work, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But look at the way he plays with this calling and chosen in verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. Listen to this. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is lowly and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being must boast in the presence of God. So these two go together, God's calling and God's election. 
God's calling and God's election. The two go hand in hand. And what we are being told here is that the way in which you, you, you come to, to conclude your, your own soul rejoices in this reality is not by peeping into it directly, like my, my cousin, sort of going, you know, it's time, going, no, no, no. It is by this diligence in the acquisition of, of these qualities, these, these spiritual qualities, you, 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 your own soul concludes the Lord has saved me, the Lord has called me, and since this is true, then the Lord chose me in eternity. Because if he hadn't chosen me in eternity, he would not have called me in time. And therefore, I would not be showing forth these qualities that are so much part of my life. So that's the first benefit. It is this sense of assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And friends, I, I want to challenge you about this. Look around. Who do you see enjoying Love, joy, and peace. And I'm talking about spiritual love, joy, and peace. Who is it? As you look around and we relate to one another in the context of the church, you, you see somebody who, who doesn't seem to, 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 to struggle, but they, they seem to, to still be just full of God. One thing is obvious. It's the spiritual growth that's taking place in their lives. They're growing. They're growing. They are never content with just flowing with the flow. They just never. They've come to know the Lord and they want to know more of him. In the midst of the trials of life, they deliberately want to know more and more of what it means to be self-controlled. They are very deli deliberate in wanting to be steadfast in their spiritual lives. And uh, they are individuals who, who want to be God-centered in all things. So you cannot miss their godliness. They are individuals whose lives are around the people of God, saving their brothers and saving their sisters. They put in their time, they put in their money into the well-being of the saints. But it never ends there. It flows beyond the saints. They want to be a blessing to the world in which they are. You can't miss it. So don't think it's a mistake or a mere accident that such individuals are not constantly wondering, now am I a Christian or am I not? And so on. No, no, no. There's no accident there. It is the truth of what Peter is talking about here. They have come to realize what Christianity is about. It's growing, growing, growing. And as they grow, assurance comes in. Let's hurry on to the second benefit. And the second benefit is that it, take, it keeps you away from what I'm calling here the spiritual cliff edge. The spiritual cliff edge. In other words, it gives you solid ground under your feet. It gives you stability in your Christian life. So it's not just assurance of what has happened in the past, that I have been elected and I have been called. It is also assurance 
about the present into the future. That I will not fall. Look with me at verse 10 again. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these things, in fact, the actual phrase there is if you these things, but obviously it's practicing these qualities. You will never fall. If you do this, you will never fall. Let me try and put it this way very quickly. That, you know, the phrase that we normally use saying once saved, always saved, in a sense is true. Because once the Lord saves you, you can never lose your salvation. The weakness with that phrase, as true as it is, is that it almost suggests that you can be half asleep spiritually. Don't worry. You still get to heaven. You, you, you can go and live in sin. Don't worry. If he saved you, you still get to heaven. You can be a, a, a mediocre brother or sister in the Lord. Don't worry. If he saved you, still get to heaven. It may not be saying so, but it almost suggests, and that's my chief quarrel with it. The better phrase is the statement, that the final perseverance of the saints. The final perseverance of the saints. The reason being that when you're thinking about persevering, you, it is suggesting effort. Effort. And it's crucial that we do not miss that point. That there's no sort of just half asleep in the back and you still get, there's nothing like that. There, there, there must be real diligence and real effort to borrow the phrase of Peter here. If you practice these things, and what are those things? Being all the more eager to add to your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge and to, to your knowledge self-control and, and to your self-control steadfastness and to your steadfastness godliness and so on. Being eager to do that. Then you will not this phrase fall is really the same phrase as stumble it can be used either way the point it is making here is, is talking about falling into sin but it's, it's, it's falling into sin in such a way that you, you mess up your life you mess up your testimony And it's, it's visible to all. That's the falling, that's the stumbling. It's visible to all. As much as people might want to look the other way, the point is they have observed, they know that this person messed it bad kind. And that's what he's referring to here. And that's because, you see, when a person is not carried away with, with trying to reach the highest heights possible spiritually, they tend to be terribly close to the cliff edge. And all that the devil needs to do is this. That's all. Just a little elbowing and they are down. That's the warning that is here. But I want to go further. Because Peter is not simply talking here about messing up one's testimony. He's talking about missing heaven. That's what he's talking about. Missing heaven. The next verse proves the point. 
We'll be looking at it next time. Verse 11. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, whatever this thing is won't happen. And because it won't happen, you will receive this glorious arrival in heaven. Is Peter teaching loss of salvation here? No. But what he's teaching is this, that it, it confirms that you were not called and you were not elected. In other words, it's literally the same argument. So, by this diligent acquisition of these qualities, what it is proving is that spiritual life is in you. Spiritual life is there. That's why we are seeing all this. The absence of that is proving that you've never had spiritual life to begin with. And it's a matter of time Temptations come. There is no solid foundation under you. The whole little superstructure that you've been putting in caves in. Caves in. It's terrible. And it's all this point of simply gliding along with everybody else in the background. God's true children are making serious progress spiritually. But you, as long as you are there, that's okay, as long as you are there. And finally, trials come, temptations come. You, you, you need to get married, and nobody's marrying you. And some unbeliever in the office proposes, and finally grabs you. You abandon church altogether because marriage was more important. You shipwreck your testimony. You've gone off. You know what? It's not that you've lost your salvation. You never had it in the first place. Jesus was never dear to you. He was not worth paying any price for. You were very close to the age. The opportunity came. You abandoned it all together. Well, friends, it's more than simply messing up a testimony. It is that you were never saved and you will not arrive in heaven. That abundant entrance that Spring spoken about in the next text will not be yours. And there was abundant proof all along. You just never bothered to seriously consider it when you were not growing. You were not growing. That's the time you should have raised serious questions. Am I saved or am I not? Because if I am saved, how can I live like this? My Savior came. He gave his entire life leaving the throne of heaven to come and live and die in my place. God, suffering as he did here on earth. And finally, taking on himself my sin, my hell, and paying for it. How can I treat him as any other business? and make marriage, or, 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 or having a job, or, or whatever else it might be, the, 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 the important thing, or promotion, and, and so many other things that we chase after in this world. How? Clearly, it's simply that you never had spiritual eyes, all along. Never. And now your end is nigh. So friends, you can see why I'm appealing. Christian, grow up. Grow up. Grow up. 
Your, your life depends on it. Your present enjoyment of spirituality depends on it. Love, joy, peace in the Holy Spirit depends on it. Your future depends on it. Grow up. Because where there is life, there will be growth. Inevitably. Where there is no growth, there is no life. Don't let anybody cheat you. There's no life. Where there is true spiritual life, there's hunger. Hunger to be more and more like Christ. Deeper, deeper, in the love of Jesus, daily let me go. Higher, higher, in the school of wisdom, more of grace to know. Deeper, deeper. Blessed Holy Spirit, take me deeper still until my life is wholly lost in Jesus and his perfect will. That's real Christianity, friends. That's real Christianity. Deeper, deeper, though it cost hard trials, deeper let me go. Rooted in the love of Jesus, let me fruitful grow. That's the hunger. I want to be more fruitful. And finally, deeper, higher, every day in Jesus, until all the conflict is past. And it finds me a conqueror, formed in his own image, and perfected at last. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the benefits that we have seen of growing in the things of God, that it helps us to confirm our calling and election. Oh, God of heaven, may each one of us take this appeal seriously that we may all the more diligently seek excellence in all spheres of our Christian lives. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.